tonight's teaching is called Weapons of God. And not only do we need to know what the weapons of God are, but we need to know how to use them. I can't go in great depth with it. We'd be here for a week. But we can touch surface to get enough for us to put on the Holy Ghost boxing gloves, load up the Holy Ghost bazooka, and learn how to shoot. Amen? Amen. Praise God. In Hosea 4.6. Hallelujah. Hosea 4.6. In, in chapter 4 and verse 6, let's read this together. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Wow. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you for being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? Now, people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I want to put a heading of under knowledge. Knowledge is a weapon, isn't it? We need to have knowledge as a weapon. Because without knowledge, it doesn't do us any good. We must know. But with knowledge, there must be truth. And we must have understanding and wisdom. So these here are all part of a weapon from God, isn't it? So not only does it say, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, but I would like to expand where it says, my people are destroyed not only for lack of knowledge, but they are destroyed for lack of truth. They are destroyed for lack of understanding. They are destroyed for lack of wisdom. Because you can have the knowledge and not the under's wisdom to utilize the knowledge. You can have the knowledge and not understand what the knowledge is, and you don't have the wisdom to how to use it. Jesus told them, shared about having the understanding, which is very important. So my people are destroyed not only for lack of knowledge, but for lack of understanding, lack of truth, and lack of wisdom. The Bible says truth makes you free, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. And the Bible also says that wisdom is to depart from evil. So these are two things that we must have. We must have truth, and we must have Wisdom also, which is a representation of departing from evil. So you can have all the knowledge and you can have all the understanding, you can have all these things, but if you don't depart from evil when you're supposed to depart from evil, you're going to get snagged. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now, does everybody understand that? In other words, even though we're walking in the natural realm, we have a carnal body. We have a flesh body, not a glorified body yet. does not mean that we are to war according to the laws of the carnal way. Amen? We are warring according to the spiritual way. Let's go on. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, hold on. So it's saying, listen, the fight's in the mind, isn't it? And if the fight is in the mind, because what's trying to happen is the, the voice of the stranger is trying to come against the knowledge of God. Why? Because if you have lack of knowledge, you will perish. You'll be destroyed, right? That's what it tells us. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So he's trying to come against the knowledge of the ways of God. Now, he's trying to tell us also, the Lord is saying, now listen, because your weapons are not carnal, you must take an understanding that your thoughts are not your own. Does everybody get it? So they obviously come from the voice of the stranger or the voice of the spirit. And you're the one making the choice. Because what is he saying? He, gives, he says, listen, for pulling down strongholds, things that are grabbing us, things that are holding, things that are preventing us from going, something that is a stronghold. In fact, we know that God is our stronghold, known as our strong tower also, isn't he? Amen? So we want to be bound to the righteous stronghold. But there are strongholds in people's lives that they have not been freed from, like bad habits and so forth and you know, demonic activity in their lives. So we see here that he's saying, casting down every argument or every thought and anything that will come against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, to, in other words, taking it, grabbing it, don't obey in it, don't obey it, but bring it under the obedience of Christ where the mind of Christ the Word of God is overtaking those ways. Okay? Now listen. He says, now, but before you can do that, now listen, in verse 6, 
and being what? Ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So you are not going to attack. You are not going to have dominion unless your obedience is first fulfilled. Then you can punish. Or in other words, the word representation of punish is to take vengeance on or take dominion over it. So unless you take these things and put them in captivity under the authority of Christ, now you can get rid of them. But you just can't get rid of them unless they are under the authority of Christ. Where the word of God or the voice of the Lord is speaking to you and telling you what to do with these thoughts. So first of all, it's just like saying um, no. No to those thoughts is taking them in captivity. What you're doing is you're delaying them, aren't they? Aren't you? So when a thought comes, you say no in the name of Jesus. Now you take them and you take dominion. No weapon formed against me can prosper. See, now you're taking punishment on it by sh shooting it with the word of God. So when a thought comes, you cast it down in the name of Jesus. And then you shoot the word. That's a weapon, isn't it? So we see here that weapons, our weapons are not natural. They are spiritual, aren't they? So we see here that, I mean, how many people, you know, when we were in the world, we just spoke whatever we thought. I mean, man, our mouth just ran like, phew, <laughs> running water. <laughs> it was dirty, too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> dirty water. And also, people just thought, spoke whatever they thought, you know, and didn't have control over their tongue, and, and their minds were just drifting everywhere. They had lustful thoughts. They had this. They had that. I mean, you know, when we were in the world, man, you know, we, there was no, in fact, we thought that there were our own thoughts. We just thought, this is how we are. <laughs> well, this is just how I am. <laughs> No, that's not how you are. <laughs> that's a lie from the devil. Amen? Amen. <laughs> oh, we caught him now. In Ephesians 6. <laughs> you know, it's like we were sharing before, you know, that soulish realm and your soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. So if the devil can motivate those, he's got you. If he can motivate it, he's got you. The first thing he does is put a thought. So he can motivate your emotion to motivate your will. Amen? In Ephesians 6, glory to God. Weapons of God. We're going to load the Holy Ghost bazooka tonight. In, ver in verse 10. <laughs> is everybody there? Finally, let my brethren be what? Strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Do you understand that? Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, not your own. Now let's go on. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, the trickery of the devil. Amen? So put on the full armor of God that you may stand against the trickery of the devil. Because what? He's got many tricks, doesn't he? Okay. In verse 12. For we do not, what? Wrestle or fight against flesh and blood, but against spiritual, against what? Principalities. Against the powers of, uh, against the rulers of darkness of this age. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness and what? Heavenly places. Praise God. So we're not fighting flesh and blood, are we? Amen. We're fighting powers of darkness. Now we're in Ephesians 6, 10, 13, or 6, 13. Is everybody there? Amen. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to what? Amen. Stand. Stand. So we must put on the full armor of God what? To stand. I want to share something with you. The full armor of God is your defense. You know, there's an offense and defense, isn't there? <laughs> the full armor of God is a representation of defense. Does everybody get it? Okay, now listen. Let's go on. What does he say? In verse um, 14. Let's read it together. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with the truth. Now wait a minute. Truth. You notice he says, gird your waist with the truth? That's a belt, isn't it? 
Uh, I share with everyone, if you don't have the truth, your pants fall down and you end up falling over them, don't you? Because the belt holds up your pants, doesn't it? So without, without truth, you end up stumbling. And we know that the Word tells us in John 8, you don't have to go there, 31 and 32, that Jesus said that my people will know, that the disciples will know the truth. If you abide in my Word and you know the truth, the truth will make you what? Free. free. The truth will make you free. Okay, so we see here that that was uh, the reference to that is John 8, 31 and 32. So he says the first thing is to what? Gird your waist with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now that covers your heart. Amen? In other words, um, it's a representation of the heart of Christ, his righteousness. The Bible tells us that um, his righteousness guards us or guides us as a way of blamelessness. In other words, we will not take on. We will not offend the Lord. We will be blameless before God. So righteousness guards our heart to walk in a blameless life. Now it's His righteousness, isn't it? Amen. Not our own. So our heart needs to be the heart of Christ. That's why it's the breastplate of righteousness. Because of God's heart, the Bible said that we would get a what? New heart. So if, his, if it's His heart in us, His heart will show off righteousness, won't it? And the reference to that is Proverbs 13, 6. Proverbs 13, 6. Hallelujah. Let's go on. In verse 15. And Ephesians 6, 15. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now we know that the gospel is a representation of the word of truth, isn't it? Or, you know, and when you know the truth, you have peace, don't you? Actually, one of the things about peace you have peace because you truly trust in God. In fact, in Philippians 4, and you can write this reference down, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, it says that um, be anxious for nothing, right? But in all things, what? Prayer and supplication. And the peace of God will guard your hearts, won't it? You know, and so we see that His peace is a representation of Trusting Him. So I want you to see that these are all parts of defenses, not attacks. These are parts of defenses, isn't it? Okay, let's go on. Above all, taking the what? Shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, He's always throwing darts at you, isn't He? So we need to have that shield of faith because He's always going to shoot something at you every day. That's a constant, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, we know that in Romans 10, 17, and this is the reference, the, the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing the Word. In other words, nothing moves you. Nothing moves you. So when the devil says, man, don't you feel this way? You say, no. When he says, don't you think this way? You say, no. He says, don't you think you should do it this way? You say, no. <laughs> See, these are all defenses, aren't they? Hallelujah. Let's go on. In verse 17. And taking the helmet of salvation. All right. The helmet of salvation. Well, that's a represent... What does the helmet cover? Your mind. Your mind. Amen. And the Bible tells us in Romans 12, 2, that we are not to be conformed to this world, but... Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. And that's in Romans 12 too. Why? Salvation is a representation of something that is salvaged. So your mind is being salvaged to become the mind of Christ. That's why we put the helmet of salvation on. Amen. Because the devil will try and tell you you ain't saved. <laughs> but we have this helmet of salvation. Of course, you know when you break covenant, you're, you need to be reestablished. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Okay, let's go on. And take the helmet of salvation and the what? Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, the sword of the Spirit, first of all, it is the Word of God, isn't it? So, to have the Spirit, you must be baptized in the Holy Ghost. So you can utilize the Word of God. Amen? Now, in Hebrews 4, 
12 and 13, it tells us about the word, which is the two-edged sword, piercing even basically the spirit, soul, and body. So these are representations of defenses, isn't it? The form of God is a representation of defense. And in verse 18, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the what? Spirit. In the Spirit. Praise be to God. Okay, so let's go a little bit further here. Um, we see that the form of God now is a, uh, it's, it's a protector, isn't it? We're to be protected by putting on the form of God. So this is a, not a weapon, but it's a protection, isn't it? It's protecting us from the darts and the weapons of the powers of darkness. But we need to be set and established in these things, don't we? And it's important that we are. Now let's go a little further. In Acts 1, let's go there. Acts 1. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 1. All glory. Weapons of God. We know that we just talked about we need to have the knowledge, right? We know that we shared that we need to understand it is a spiritual war, not a physical war. And we must understand the importance of putting on the full armor of God because it's your protector, your defense, isn't it? Amen. And there are, that's why there are certain characters of the full armor of God. I mean, we could spend a week just talking about the full armor of God. But let's go a little bit further. In Acts 1, in chapter 4, in verse 4, I'm sorry. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Is everybody there? Amen. Let's read it together. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Now understand this. This is important. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples, right? He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father. But to what? Wait for the promise of the Father, right? Okay. Now, here we must understand that Jesus is saying submit. Submit. Because what's about to happen is God is about to give his people power, isn't he? Amen. Now let's go on. In verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So God was telling them, listen, if you'll submit to me and listen to this, I'm going to give you the power to resist the devil. Does everybody get it? Now in verse 7 and verse 8 it says what? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So we see here that Jesus is telling them, listen, if you'll submit to me and you'll obey me and you'll submit to my authority, I will send you power. And the Bible tells us in James 4, 7, you don't have to go there, this is a reference. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. So if you don't submit to God, when you resist the devil, he isn't fleeing, is he? Amen. Because you've clogged the flow of the spirit of power by being disobedient. Disobedience always stops the flow of the power of God. Hallelujah. Does everybody understand it? But obedience brings the power of God. So if his disciples were disobedient, they wouldn't have gotten baptized in the Holy Ghost, right? And they wouldn't have gotten the power. But because they were submissive, they were able to receive the power and they were able to resist the devil and the devil had to flee. Does everybody get it? So we know that that's a weapon, isn't it? Submission. Hallelujah. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 3. Oh, hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Praise be to God. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Hallelujah. In verse 7. Is everybody there? Let's read it together. But if the ministry of death 
written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could now look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Now, did you hear that? How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Now, what does Spirit mean? Ah, how will the ministry of the breath of God be more glorious? That's why He what? Sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in me and you. That's why it's called the sword of the Spirit. How will the ministry of... So we see that we're in the ministry of the Spirit, aren't we now? We're no longer under the laws. We are submissive to the laws by the walk of the Spirit because it's the Spirit that wrote the laws, isn't it? But we're not under the laws because the law is within us and manifesting if we're obedient. Actually, we're beyond the laws. You and I are now more accountable than the laws. Everybody get it? Why? Because God has given us the power to be obedient. You and I are accountable for more than just what the law was because it's now the ministry of the Spirit. And of course, if it's the ministry of the Spirit, that means it's the ministry of breath. No longer things that are written of rituals on the outwardness. It's things that are spoken. Amen? Now listen. In other words, nothing is activated until it is spoken because it is the ministry of the Spirit. Amen? Nothing is activated until it is spoken. Now, that's why the Lord says, repent. Well, when you confess your sins and you repent, it activates the blood of Jesus, doesn't it? That's why you, if you ever notice people that are having a struggle and you ask them, man, are you, are you praying your prayers? Are you speaking? Are you, are you praying the Word of God? Are you speaking the Word of God? Are you? And they'll say, no, I'm praying in my mind. Well, let me tell you something. You'll be beat if you're praying in your mind. You'll get your butt kicked. That's what the devil wants you to do. Amen? Look, let's go to Proverbs 18.21. Proverbs 18, 21. Glory to the Lamb of God. Proverbs 18, 21. Hallelujah. Yeah. Proverbs 18, 21. Is everybody there? Let's read it together. Is everybody there? Death and life are in the power of a tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So we see death and life are in the power of the tongue. So we see that this is the ministry of the Spirit, right? Or it's the ministry of the tongue, isn't it? <laughs> That's where we got the Holy Ghost, so we can pray in tongues. Glory to God! See the ministry of the tongue? It's the ministry of tongues. <laughs> Hallelujah. So what you speak is what you get. Amen. 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 So if death and life is in the power of the tongue, since it's the ministry of the Spirit, you can actually curse yourself, can't you? You can't actually cause your own self to be a stumbling block by what you say. Because what you sow is what you reap. Amen. 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 What you sow is what you reap. So you can be setting up your own stumbling block by the things that you say. So we must be careful. But if we speak the things, in other words, there's like two reservoirs, and I'm not doing a teaching on the tongue. But what you hear, in other words, that's why you must listen to what you're, you must hear what the voice is before you speak. Because sometimes we shoot off in the mouth and we go, Ugh, and we go, oh Lord, forgive me. Well, praise God. Thank God we need to be quick to repent, huh? Lord, forgive me for what I just said about that person. Lord, forgive me. For whatever. Lord, forgive me for lying. Forgive me for, Lord, forgive me for whatever. You know, forgive me for trying to, you know, whatever. So, thank, because the blood of Jesus. So when we say, forgive me, Lord, that activates the blood of the Lamb, doesn't it? And it washes us, washes the sin away. So we see that death and life are in the power of the tongue. So it is the ministry of the tongue or ministry of the Spirit, which means breath. Does everybody get that? Now, it's like a trigger is your tongue, isn't it? So what you speak is going to shoot for God or shoot for the devil. 
It's pulling the trigger. Amen? Whatever you speak is either going to shoot for God or shoot for the devil. All the weapons of God are activated by what you speak. Every weapon of God is activated when it is spoken. Every weapon. Amen? Amen. Good. Let's turn to uh, Matthew 10. Glory to God. Oh, God's people must understand this. This is so important. There are so many believers being beat up. So many believers missing the promises of God. You've got to speak those things in. You've got to speak it. You got to speak it. You can't fight the devil in your mind. He already won that battle. Does everybody get it? He defeated Eve, didn't he? By the mind. <laughs> he conned her. Well, he's the he's the most cunning beast created, right? So we have to have the discernment to know who we're listening to before we speak. Glory to God. In Matthew 10 and verse 32. Is everybody there? Amen. Let's read this together. Therefore, whoever confesses me before man, you see that word confess? That means you've got to speak it, right? Him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before man, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Let's go on. Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Does everybody get that? Now, he gave us the, he gave us the conclusion. He gave us the, the information, the hidden, the hidden word here, which means confess. Confess. And what was that sword? It's known as confess. Speaking the word is a representation of the sword. That's why it's known as the sword of the spirit. The word spoken. Does everybody get that? Okay. So Jesus gave us the whole input here when he says, if anyone confesses me, well, how are you going to confess him? Well, you confess him by speaking the word, by testimony. Well, how was someone going to understand unless you spoke it? <laughs> they can't read your mind, right? Okay. Let's go to Matthew 4. Matthew 4. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, you know, you're not going to write a letter to the devil, are you, and say, I rebuke you, devil? No. Devil, get behind me. <laughs> and you can't tell him, listen, devil, go to 2 Corinthians. <laughs> that ain't going to work, man. <laughs> you got to tell the devil. you got to speak it. <laughs> Amen. Amen? No, Jesus never showed up and quoted scripture, quoted locations of the devil. <laughs> he never said, listen, devil. <laughs> this is how it is. In 1 John, <laughs> he said, it is written. Amen? Amen? Come on, let's go to Matthew 4 and verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by who? The devil. the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command it. These stones become bread. So did the devil speak to Jesus? Yes. He's the one that said it, right? Now, what did Jesus say? But he answered and said. So that means he what? He spoke. And what did he say? It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen? So we see here that Jesus did not write. Jesus did not write something to him, did he? Okay, praise be to God. So we see Jesus spoke it, right? Now let's go to 1 John 5. 1 John 5. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Okay, praise God. 1 John chapter 5, <clears throat> starting at verse 6. Now, you must... Pay close attention here. This is called revelation knowledge. And we're going to get into this. So hold on. In verse 6 it says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, 
not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Now, let's go a little further. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Now listen, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. These are the ones that bear witness in heaven, okay? The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And it says, and these are one. So the Father, the Word, and the Spirit are one. Remember that Jesus became the Word, flesh, right? But he was not the Son of God beforehand. He was known as the Word. There was no Son of God. He became the Son of God when the Word became flesh. Okay, now listen. So we see here that they are the ones that bear witness in heaven. Now listen in verse 8. And there are three that bear witness on earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Now, this is powerful because the, the weapon of God... Remember, Jesus is the name of the Christ. Is everybody with me? Jesus is the name of the Christ that came into the world, didn't he? Now, I want you to understand that something manifested here. The Spirit manifested in the natural. The Word manifested in the natural. And the Father manifested in the natural. The three that bear witness in heaven became natural on earth. Does everybody get this? God said, here's the weapon. Does everybody understand that? Here's your weapon. Your weapon and my weapon became natural to where it was actually tangible. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring you peace. I came to bring you a what? Sword. He was the manifested sword of the Spirit. He was the manifested armor of God. He was the manifested Word. He was the manifested Spirit. He was the manifested Father. Right? Remember, he says, if you see me, you see the Father. Now I want to show you what each one represents. Okay, now hold on. Hold on. You'll have to hold on now, okay? Now, I want to start with the blood. Okay, it says, and there are three that bear witness on earth, right? It says the what? The, the Spirit. The this is on earth. The Spirit, the water, the water, and the blood. I want to share with you what each one means. The blood is a representation of the Father. The blood is a representation of the Father. Because Jesus, His Father... Hello? He didn't have an earthly father, did he? So the blood was from the father. Does everybody get it? So that, in fact, in Leviticus 17, 11, I think it says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. <laughs> so Jesus' life had to be from the blood of the father. That's why he said, if you see me, you see the father. Now listen. In fact, to my understanding, the determination of the child some of the factors have to do with the blood of the father determining the blood of the child not that they will be the same but some of the determining factors is the representation of the blood of the father that's why jesus said he was born with no sin and if the life of the flesh is in the blood then jesus could not have sinned his blood had to be pure and blameless so his blood was from the Father. You, does everybody understand that? That's how the Father came into the world, was through the blood. Hallelujah. That's why the Bible says, no man comes to the Father unless he is drawn. <laughs> All right? Unless he is drawn. Now, let me share with you. The Bible says that Jesus says, I am the way, truth, and life. The blood represents the cross, which is known as the what? Way. Now, let me share with you. Oh, this is powerful. In fact, <clears throat> everything is passed on through the blood. It's known as the atoning gateway. Nothing can come to you unless it comes through the blood. Right? I mean, a spirit can't come to you unless it's through the blood, isn't it? You can't get the Holy Ghost unless you've repented, Amen. which activated the blood. You can't get baptized in the Holy Spirit and receive the Holy Spirit until you receive Jesus. The only way you can receive Jesus is through the blood, Amen. the blood of the Lamb. Is everybody with me? Amen. So we see here that the manifestation of the Father was actually through the blood. How God came into the natural realm through the blood. Okay, 
Now, the water, is everybody with me? The water was a representation of the Word because the Bible says, wash, be washed with the wa Word. Wash with the Word. Is everybody with me? In fact, it's uh, in Ephesians 5.26, it says to be washed with the Word. Now, the Word is a representation of what? The truth, isn't it? The Word is the truth. So we see that we're going to where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life again. The blood is a representation of the way, right? Now, we know that the, the Father manifested through the blood. The Word manifested through the flesh. Does everybody get it? Because the Bible says, then the Word became what? Flesh. flesh. Now, listen. In the Spirit... Oh, this is powerful. The Spirit became life, didn't He? So we see that Jesus was the name of the Christ. The Christ is the name, if you turn, turn what the, the meaning of the word Christ means, it means anointed, doesn't it? Which represents God's power, doesn't it? Now God named His power, didn't He? He called it Jesus. The name of God's power, His name is Jesus. Because he was known as the Christ. So we see here that the Bible says, and we're going to go to this, his name became manifest, didn't it? Is everybody with me? The name of God became manifest. So his name became manifest. His word became manifest. His promises became manifest. His spirit became manifest. Everything became manifest because it was God who became manifest on this earth and everything came with him. Is everybody with me? So your three weapons manifested right here. The Spirit represented His name. The water represented His Word. <laughs> and the blood represented, of course, we know the Father, but we know that the blood represented the atoning gateway. Is everybody with me? Okay, let's go a little further. I'm going to show you. Because in 1 Corinthians 15.45, you don't have to go there, well, maybe we better go there. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians 15.45. Just so we get this. All oh, glory to God. 1 Corinthians 15.45. 1 Corinthians 15.45. Is everybody there? Amen. Let's read this together. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. That was Jesus was the name of the life-giving spirit because he was the name of the Christ. So the manifestation of the weapons of God came into the natural realm. Does everybody get it? Everything came when Jesus came in for me and you. In other words, the blood was the gateway for me and you to get everything, wasn't it? So Jesus was the life-giving spirit. Well, you'd have to be spirit to be a life-giving spirit, wouldn't you? You'd have to have everything. You'd have to be God himself <laughs> to be a life-giving spirit because no man can give somebody else life. Amen. Only God can give life. Amen? Amen? Now God works through me and you to be the way, truth, and life, doesn't he? So we can lead people for the way, give them the truth that they can have life. Amen? But we can't give them life, but we can lead him to the giver of life, can't we? Amen. Amen? Okay, praise God. Let's go a little further. Now, we see here that right here, right now, Jesus manifests, we see that he's manifested three powerful weapons. His name, his word, and his blood. His name, his word, and his blood. Is everybody with me? He manifested his three most important weapons, and that is his name, his word, and his blood. To God be the glory. And I want to go on each one of these things just a, a, a little bit. I'm not going to go in depth with these, but we're just going to go a little bit. Let's go to Acts 4 and verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Ooh. By which we must be what? Saved. Praise be to God. So we see that the name of of Jesus is the only way that somebody can get saved. So there is salvation in his name, isn't there? Amen. Amen. Let's go to John 16. John 16 and verse 23. And in that day 
you will ask me nothing. But most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Hallelujah. So now we know that in his name, in other words, we can ask in the name. You can't ask anything from God in anyone else's name, but only in the name of Jesus. So we have actually fellowship in his name, don't we? Because in his name it brings fellowship with the Father, doesn't it? <coughs> Hallelujah. And only the name of Jesus can bring fellowship with the Father. Does everybody get it? Because you're going to see here, powerful. I'll show you why. In John 17. Is everybody there? Amen. In John 17, in verse 6, and we will read this together. John 17, verse 6, and it says, I have manifested your name. Whose name? Jesus. Whose name? Jesus. Not what name. Whose God. name? God's name. And what's his name? Jesus. Come on now. I have manifested. Who's Jesus speaking to? No, he's not. He's praying here. He's speaking to the Father. He's saying, Father, I have manifested your name. What's the name of the Father? Jesus. Amen. Jesus. Does everybody get it? Come on, the Father became manifest. The name of the Father is Jesus. He just said, he's praying. He says, I have manifested your name. What's his name? Jesus. That's the name of the Father. That's why no man can go to the Father except for through the Father. Amen. Come on, does everybody get it? Amen. That's why it's a name above all names. Everything, all the attributes of the Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisa, all of those have been manifested in the name of Jesus as the Father. That's why the Bible says in Isaiah, and he will be known as what? Prince of Peace. Right? Everlasting Father. God Almighty manifested when Jesus, when, when, um, when Moses went and asked, when the, God revealed himself to Moses, and he said, who, who should I say who sent me? He says, I am. In other words, I, what do you mean? Well, what's your name? What do you mean, what's my name? I am everything. Then, then Jesus comes into the natural realm and says, I am the way, truth, and life. Well, what's the name of the I am? Jesus. That's the name of the Father. That's why you have dominion over everything in the name of Jesus. Fullness in the name of Jesus. Everything is available. Every attribute of God's name in the Old Testament has been manifested in his name in the New Testament, named Jesus. It says in the three, in the three are one in heaven, right? The Spirit, the Word, and the Father. They're one. Well, if the Word had to become manifest, so did the Father's name have to come manifest. Oh, don't let that blow over your head. <laughs> Praise be to God. <laughs> In Philippians 2. Oh, nobody can go to Daddy except for through Daddy. Glory to God. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. You know, that's why people get all freaked out. Well, man, am I praying to Jesus or am I praying to the Father? Am I? Yeah. You're praying to the Father in the name of Jesus. In other words, no one can get to Him except for through His own name. <laughs> okay. Because they're one, aren't they? Amen. <laughs> Glory! Revelation. Okay. Ch uh, chapter 2 in Philippians verse 9. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, who? Jesus, and given him the name which is above every name. If it's above every name, then it means above the Old Testament name too, isn't it? Okay. That at the name of what? Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Of those in heaven. Does everybody get it? And those on the earth. And those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father. <laughs> so, 
every knee shall bow. So do you understand in the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Okay, let's go to Mark 16. That means you have dominion. If every knee must bow, that means you've been given dominion in the name of Jesus. Does everybody get it? In Mark 16. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Mark 16. Glory. <clears throat> In verse 16. Oh, no, verse 17. Let's get right to the meat. Is everybody there? Amen. Let's read this together. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name. Now let me tell you something. He's saying, here's my power of attorney. In my name, they will what? Cast out devils. They will what? Speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will what? In whose name? In his name. So we see here that's power of attorney. In other words, in his name, please understand this. His name, oh, get this in your spirit. The name of Jesus is a representation of it is finished. It is finished. It is completed. It is, you know, when Jesus was on the cross, his name, Jesus said, when he said it is finished, it means when you say in the name of Jesus, it's done. Amen. Do you remember when they came to get Jesus in the, in the, in the garden, wherever, and, and the soldiers came? And, and, they, and, and, they, and they said, and they asked him his name or, or, or if you're the right person. And, and they said, what's your name? And he said, Jesus. And they all flew back. <laughs> and, they, and they couldn't get it. But when he said, Jesus, bam, they all went down. And they had to get back up again. He was letting them know. In fact, he said, um, you come with clubs and so forth. And I said, well, you know, he says, no, the power's not been given to you. I mean, you don't have power over me. It's only been given to you because I've allowed it. He's allowed it because he was God. <laughs> Glory to God. So we see that in the name. Let me tell you something. The next time you speak the name of Jesus, don't take it so delicately. In the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. In the name of Jesus, the demons tremble. In the name of Jesus, you're saying that. And when you speak the name of Jesus, you're saying it's completed. It's finished. And I've been given a power of attorney. I've been granted the same things that Jesus manifested for me. Now he's manifesting in me and through me. Does everybody see it? Let me tell you, when the devils look at you, they see the name of Jesus. They see the word. They see the Christ in you. But see, if they can... If the devil can convince you up here that you're not, if he can prevent you from knowing who you are, then he can get you. But he's afraid. Once you, he knows. Once you know who you are in Christ, he runs and he attacks you like a mosquito, little vermin. You know how a fly is real pest? That's how the devil is. It's the best. Praise God. Okay, hallelujah. Let's talk about the word now. In Psalm 119. Like I said, I'm not going to get real in-depth with this stuff, but we're going to do enough of it <laughs> so we can use these weapons. Glory to God. Weapons of God. In Psalm 119. Oh, Lord, we bless your name. Oh, Lord, we bless your name. In Psalm 119, verse 5. I believe. Let me see here. No, that ain't it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 119, 105. Psalm 119, 105. Is everybody there? Let's read it together. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now listen. If the word is a lamp unto your feet, that's in other words, you're able to see because you have the word in you. It doesn't become a a light onto your path until you speak it. That's why you do daily confessions. You're speaking the word. What's happening? It's putting the light to your path. Somebody get it? That's why it's a ministry of the what? Spirit. That's why Jesus said, if you ask, 
In other words, you must speak it in His name. It will happen. And, and that's why He says, and anyone who believes in Me, and so forth, follows Me, in My name they will. Well, how are you going to cast out a devil in your thoughts? you got to speak it, don't you? Okay. So everything is activated by the spoken word. And Hebrews 4, let's go there. Hebrews 4. Glory, hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 4. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It doesn't become a light unto your path until you speak it. Remember, light out takes darkness. That's why the devil don't want you to speak the word. <laughs> Glory. Okay, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living, isn't it? And powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So we see that the word actually pierces the spirit, soul, and body. That's how there's healing, isn't there? That's how there's revelation. That's how there's... Um, impartations through the Word, isn't there? Amen? That's why it convicts us, doesn't it? The Spirit speaks to us in the Word. So we see here that the Word is a, uh, like a, it, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, isn't it? Okay, let's go to Psalm 138. Psalm 138. Hallelujah. <coughs> Psalm 138 and verse 2. Glory to God. Hallelujah. His word. And verse 2, let's read it together. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Now, I want you to understand something. His word is above all of his name, isn't it? Mm. His word is above his name. Does everybody get it? His word is above his name. In his name sends forth the word, doesn't it? But his word is above his name. Because without the word, nothing can be done. Does everybody get it? So we see here that his name is like a trigger, isn't it? In the name of Jesus. <laughs> Shoots the word. Because <laughs> that's your bullet, isn't it? That's your dart. That's what you put the Holy Ghost, that's what you fill the Holy Ghost bazooka with, is the word of God. And the trigger is manifested by the name of Jesus. Is everybody with me? Okay. That's why you must speak it. And Isaiah 55. Glory, hallelujah. My master, my king, my love, my hope, and my strength. And my hero, my hero, my everything. That's my daddy. He's wonderful. Is everybody there, please? Isaiah 55:10. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Does everybody understand what he's saying? In other words, it's watering the soil. It's watering the seeds, isn't it? It's, it's not returning back. It's watering it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. Now, if Jesus... The Spirit of God, of the Spirit of Christ is in you. When the Word comes out of your mouth, it will not come back void. Amen. So shall my Word be that comes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I, what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. Glory. Glory. So we see here that His Word will not return void, will it? In Psalm 33. Oh, glory. We see here that His Word is above His name. It's a light unto our path. 
It pierces the spirit, soul, and body. Convicts the heart. Knows the intents of the thoughts. And it won't return void. Man, we, you know, how can we be losing? We can't. It's only the devil that tells you that. And people listen. And if they'll become double-minded. <coughs> Glory. Psalm 33. Woo-hoo. <laughs> In verse 6. Psalm 33 and verse 6. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord, and let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Glory to God. Everything was made by the word, wasn't it? Amen. Hallelujah. In Isaiah 40, verse 8, and it says, And the word stands forever. God's word stands forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. God's word stands forever. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Now, we just talked about his name. We talked about the word. I'm going to talk about the blood. Like I said, I'm not going to go real deep into this, but we're going to touch on it enough so that you know what the weapons of God are. And begin to utilize them. Revelations 1. Revelation chapter 1. Glory. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 1. Remember we talked about the weapons of God were manifested in Jesus. He said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. He was the way, truth, and life. He was the blood. He was the, the word. And he was the name that was manifest. He was the life-giving spirit. Glory to God. In Revelation chapter 1. Hallelujah. In verse 4. Is everybody there? John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Listen now. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and what? Washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We see here that his blood, remember I share with you, the blood was the atoning gateway. The blood. So through his blood, we couldn't receive anything unless it was through his blood. So his blood, first of all, washes away the sins. That's the power of the blood, man. The power of the blood washes away the sins. It removes the hold of Satan, or what I want to say, removes the hold of the sin that Satan had in us, didn't it? The blood. When you ask God for forgiveness, the hold of sin is off of you. Amen? That doesn't mean the devil isn't going to try and attack you again. It doesn't mean that he's going to try and get a hold of you again. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to sin again. But when you blow it, you can confess the blood. You confess your sin and activates the blood. Why? Because it is the ministry of the Spirit. Nothing is activated unless it is spoken. Yeah. Amen? Even sin is washed away with a spoken repentance. Yeah. To God be the glory. And of course, we know that... Um, hallelujah. All right, let's go on to Revelation 12. <laughs> Ooh, I love it. Glory, Revelation 12. Revelation 12, in verse 9. Glory to God. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. In verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the what? Blood of the Lamb and by the what? Word of their testimony. In other words, they spoke it, didn't they? And they did not love their lives to death. So they overcame. So you overcome. Let me tell you something. Satan hates the blood of Jesus because it defeated him. It disarmed him. The blood of the Lamb disarmed the powers of darkness over our lives. 
He hates the blood of the lamb, but he loves the blood of flesh. But he hates the blood of the lamb. Do you ever notice that flies hang around the blood of flesh, don't they? That's right, Beelzebub, prince of the flies, isn't he? <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, let's go to Luke 22. Luke 22, the blood. The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Praise be to God for the blood. Oh, that's why we sing the blood, all oh, the blood of Jesus. The devils hate it. The devils hate the blood. In Luke 22 and verse 2, I mean in verse 20, Luke 22 and verse 20, I'm sorry. Jesus is over here and he says, he's with his disciples at the Last Supper and he says, likewise, he, and, and likewise he, Jesus, also took the cup after supper saying, this is the, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. In other words, the blood was the gateway, the atoning gateway for the new covenant to be manifest in me and you. And the new covenant is what? The ministry of the Spirit. That you and I are blessed in every spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Right? Does everybody get it? That we are oneness in authority with Christ. Come on, this is through the blood. <laughs> and we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Through the blood. Through the blood. Why? Because it's the new covenant. And because there's the new covenant, all of these things have been manifested for me and you through the blood. Does everybody get it? Hallelujah. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Oh, glory. Hebrews 10. <laughs> oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. In Hebrews 10 and verse 19. Glory to God. Is everybody there? Amen. Come on, let's read this together. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, what is the holiest? That is where the spirit, the ark, was put. Remember, there was the outer court, the holy place, and the holiest, or the most holy place. And that's where the priest went in once a year, right? Amen. Okay. So now you and I can access the spirit through the blood of the Lamb. Does everybody get it? Actually, we can access the presence of God through the blood of the Lamb. And the devil hates the presence of God, doesn't he? In fact, God, the pres God's presence reveals the devil, doesn't he? Come on now. In verse 20, By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from all or any evil conscience and our bodies washed with the pure water. So you and I draw, we can make go boldly to the throne room of God, to the Holy of Holies, to the blood of the Lamb by putting the presence of God on our lives. Amen? Hallelujah. In other words, he is our stronghold, isn't he? He is our high tower. Glory to God. Now let's go to Exodus. Exodus 12. So when you speak the blood of the lamb, the devil hates it. See, that's why it's important for you and me to apply the blood of Jesus, huh? Glory. The blood of the lamb come against you, devil. The blood of the lamb. I'm washed by the blood. Exodus 12 and verse 15, or verse 5. Is everybody there? Now this is when Moses was hearing from God and they was take Moses was sent to take the Jews out of the bondage of Pharaoh's hand out of Egypt and they, and God was using the plagues and and the Lord was getting ready to strike the firstborn of all the Egyptians or actually he, he was getting you know when God sends the plague or whatever you got to be covered by the blood or you get hit too so this is what happened he said in verse 5 your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. 
to understand that Jesus was killed at when? Amen. In fact, it was during the day, but God caused it to be dark, didn't he? So that the Jews would understand he was the Lamb of God. He was the Lamb that, this Lamb right here, that was the Passover. Okay, in verse 7. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and on the lentil of the houses where they eat. Does everybody get that? So they're going to what? Apply it, aren't they? Now go to verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Does everybody understand it? So you and I need to apply the blood of Jesus on me, on our possessions. Amen. Why? So the destroyer can't come through. Now I want you to understand something. The Lord sees the blood on you. The Lord sees the blood on you. It's not about the devil. It's about the Lord. The, the Lord sees the blood on you. He's the one that's going to prevent the destroyer to come on you. So we need to be blemish free. That's why I shared the devil hates the blood of the lamb, doesn't he? Of course, because if you're pleading the blood of Jesus, God's holding the devil back. Glory to God. So we just talked about more weapons, right? We talked about his name, his word, and the blood. I want to talk about, just very briefly, in 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. Hallelujah. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Stop. Spiritual gifts are a weapon from God for you. And if you go to verse 4, it says, There are diversities of the gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same spirit. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Huh. For, in other words, and it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, uh, faith, uh, gifts of healing, um, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different tongues, praying in tongues, of course, and uh, interpretation of tongues. So these are gifts of the Spirit. These are weapons from God for you. Why? Because you're going to get counsel, correction, and direction. The Bible says that the Spirit is going to tell you things to come. While you're praying in the Holy Ghost, God is revealing to you what He wants to. He can reveal a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, word of, you know, whatever it is. Interpretation of In fact, you can walk in interpretation of tongues by praying in tongues. So the gifts of the spirits are weapons of God. Amen? Does everybody get that? Okay, let's go to Luke 22. And then one more scripture and we're done. Luke 22, 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have what? Prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. What did he do? prayed so satan is trying to sift you isn't he so you and i must what pray. we must pray and we know that the bible tells us to pray always in the spirit doesn't it in ephesians and it also tells us to pray in tongues in jude 20 doesn't it build yourself up in the most holy faith by praying in the spirit by praying in the spirit so a weapon of god is also a prayer we must pray and, of course, speaking is a representation of praying. But the word prayer is a representation of communion with God, intercession. Speaking the word is not praying. I mean, yes, we're praying, and we're, but we're attacking the devil, aren't we? But let God be your weapon, too, because God is your fighter, isn't he? So when you pray to the Lord, he's interceding. He's, you're moving the hand of God on, on your behalf, right? Okay. So prayer is a weapon of God. And in Matthew 16, in Matthew 16... In Matthew 16 and verse 17. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. He revealed that Jesus is the Christ, didn't he? The anointing one and his anointing. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, in other words, on this revelation, Peter, 
that I am the Christ, Jesus is the Christ, I will build my church because it's the Spirit that builds the church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the what? Keys of the kingdom of heaven. So we see that another weapon is the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And what are they? And he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So the Bible tells us that we are to bind the strong man, which are the powers of darkness. They are demons. And we are to loose the individuals. So binding and loosing, a key locks and unlocks, doesn't it? And I'm not going into the teaching of this. But I'm just sharing with you that this is a weapon of God. That's why it's important for me and you to bind the principalities and powers of darkness, wickedness in heavenly places, and every spirit under the authority of Satan and every strong man coming against your prayers and yourself in the name of Jesus. Why? Because they're trying to interfere with the angels that are moving on behalf of your prayers. Then you loose yourself and those from the strongholds. You loose them from the hindrances. Just because you bind a devil doesn't mean he's gone. When you loose him, means he's gone. Now loose the people from him. So if you bind something, it can't do anything. It's making a way of escape. Now you loose the individual by it's releasing that individual from the bondage of that demon. So everybody get it? So just a quick review. We see here that God has manifested his weapons, hasn't he? We talked about knowledge being a weapon. We talked about the full armor of God being a weapon in a way because it's a defensive weapon, isn't it? We talked about that it, nothing is activated unless it is spoken because the tongue has the power of life and death. We talked about the manifestation of Jesus coming into the world as a weapon. His name is a weapon. The blood is a weapon and his word is a weapon. Amen. We talked about his presence as a weapon for me and you. Right? We got to have God's presence. And we talked about the gifts of the Spirit being a weapon for me and you. We talked about prayer being a weapon, and we talked about the keys of the kingdom being weapons of binding and loosening. Amen? Now remember, nothing is activated unless it is spoken. So let's begin to use them. Let's begin to use them. Don't think them. Speak them. Amen? Father, we give you glory. We give you honor and we give you praise. Lord, we thank you for your word. We plead the blood of Jesus on the seed. Lord, we ask that you'll quicken us by your spirit because your spirit brings us to the remembrance of the word. Lord, quicken us to the things that we need to say that we may be the walking epistle and that as we speak it will become the sword of the spirit and that we may bring glory to your name and expand your kingdom. And we promise to give you all the glory, Jesus. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.